Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010, Summer Session 2019. Here's our book, Introduction to World Philosophy, a multicultural reader. So this is the first video in preparation for Exam 2, and we are turning to Part 3 of the book, Epistemology. And we'll be going over Nagarjuna and Gangesha. So Nagarjuna is a Buddhist who says there are no valid absolute truth claims and Gangesha says yes there are and he responds to Nagarjuna's arguments against the ability to have self-evident truths so Nagarjuna is trying to prepare people for the Buddhist realization that there is no self there's no individual unit of personality that stays the same from one moment to the next. That's the Hindu concept of Atman, and the Buddhists say there is no Atman, Anatman. And similarly, there are no absolute truth claims that are valid. Because to say, oh, this is true. Well, why is that true? This is true because of that. Well, why is that next thing true? Well, because of this. You end up with what's called an infinite regress. And if you can't um, find some justification for where that infinite regress ends, then you have no valid ground by which to judge absolute truths. And so infinite regress is one of the evidences that there, one of the pieces of evidence that there's no such thing as this absolute knowledge claims. And the circular reasoning is, is the other logical flaw that Nagarjuna points out. You know, why, why do you believe that the universe was created? Uh, it says so in the Bible. Well, why do you believe the Bible? Well, it agrees with the Big Bang Theory. Well, why do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? Well, it because it, it is mirrored in the Bible story of creation. So that's a circular reasoning. And you could, to get out of that circle, you'd say, oh, I believe the Bible because it's supported by science. Why do you believe science? Oh, I believe that because it's supported by mathematics. Well, why do you believe in mathematics? And so on and so on. So that's Nagarjuna's idea of the infinite regress. If you turn to page, uh, and, and just as a brief foreshadowing, Gangesha says, okay, I see, that sounds like subtle reasoning, and yet you do act as if you believe. He's not speaking to Nagarjuna directly, but he's speaking to people who come up with the same arguments against truth claims. And Gangesha's response is that you contradict your own so-called so belief by your behavior. You don't believe we can have true knowledge of anything? Well then, why is it when you want to get rid of mosquitoes, you create a fire that you can put then wet fuel on to create smoke? If you don't believe fire creates smoke, because you don't believe in any truth claims, why do you act as if you do believe it? That is a pragmatic contradiction that, um, you know, it contradicts your claim that you don't believe in, in truth, that you don't believe in any trustworthy, unvarying truths about the world. So it's not, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an innocent until proven guilty philosophy. So if you look on page 318, just very briefly, so Gungesha in the middle, Gungesha dismisses this concern, you know, that maybe everything's an illusion. Maybe we're living in a dream or something like that. Nothing is dependable. We saw Descartes come to that kind of a thought process too. So Gangesha dismisses this concern. There is no reason to engage in skeptical doubt of this kind. We have no reason to think that our faculties systematically mislead us. So they're, they're realists. Just get real. Okay, maybe we're being deluded by a computer simulation to think that we have a body, this and that. But why do you really want to engage in that kind of speculation. Where's the reasonable, where's the reasons for that kind of speculation? Yeah, perhaps it's remotely possible, but look at your behavior. You go on acting as if it, that isn't the case. You act as if we're living in the world as it is actually presented to us. So that's his main response to the idea that you can't support a, a truth claim. If you really believe what you're saying, why do you act as if we can support we can trust our knowledge. All right, so this is, these two readings are, they're short and they're very self-evident. You can get all you need uh, for the exam questions from the introductory notes and the short excerpts that, that are provided. So here is, uh, so 
this video will be going over for exam two, part B, questions one and two. What does Nagarjuna mean by infinite regress and circular reasoning? And how does Gangesha reject the issue of circular reasoning and infinite regress? So we went over that um, and I'll read a little bit more and then we'll wrap up this video. So if you look on page 315, um, actually look over on page 314 to the very bottom, Nagarjuna mounts an onslaught on the Nyaya notion of a source of knowledge. Realists deny Buddhist teachings in asserting, among other things, that some things are self-existent. For example, God, individual selves, universals, I mean, universal truths. Nagarjuna states his opponent's objections to the Buddhist thesis of interdependent origination and emptiness, which entail that nothing is self-existent, and then proceeds to disarm them by showing the faultiness of suppositions on which they rely. So then there's this dialogue between the realists and Nagarjuna. So the realists ask, how can you say that nothing has self-existence? What is the basis, the knowledge source for your claim, Nagarjuna? There is none. If you're thinking like that is what's wrong. Realists, since you cite no knowledge source, you have no right to say what you say. So we'll finish the rest of this little dialogue. If you don't believe in true belief, if you don't believe that any beliefs can be justified, say the realists to Nagarjuna, why should we believe your claim? You're claiming that it's true that there's no such thing as truth. Well, if it's true what you say, then there is a truth and what you say isn't true. So it's, it's a logical contradiction to claim that there's no such thing as truth claims. So here's what Nagarjuna says. He says, only according to you do I need a knowledge source. Your views block appreciation of the Buddhist message, but through seeing the untoward ramifications of your positions, your mind may be opened. For example, tell me, once you identify a knowledge source for a claim, what is the source for the identification? You fall into an infinite regress looking for the sources of your sources. Okay, here's the source of my knowledge. All right then, how did you determine what qualifies as a source of knowledge? Well, this is how I determined it. Well, how did you determine that? And so you can't, he's saying, you can't ever come to the first source of knowledge. You always have to ask what's the source for your decision to make that decision that that's the source of knowledge. So you fall into an infinite regress. And if you don't fall into an infinite regress, then you end up with what's called circular reasoning. Uh, what, what, you know, for example, well, why do you believe uh, what, the New Testaments? Or why do you believe the Gospel of Matthew? Well, it's supported by the, go the Gospel of Mark. Well, why do you believe the Gospel of Mark? Because it's supported by the Gospel of John. Well, why do you believe the Gospel of John? Because it's supported by the Gospel of Matthew. So it's just going in a circle. You're, each of the knowledge sources is supposed to prove the other. And that's just, so, and that's kind of alluded to in slightly confusing language here, continuing on page 315. So the realists say, in response to the claim that all knowledge claims end up in an infinite regress trying to prove your first principles, the realists say a source of knowledge is like a self-illuminating lamp, justifying both its result and itself. Or the situation is like a scale that can be calibrated. Identification of sources of knowledge depends on the objects to be made known. So the self-illuminating lamp, that's the source of knowledge. It illuminates itself and it's a source of us being able to see everything else. So there you go. There's an example of a self-illuminating, uh, of a first principle of knowledge. And then Nagarjuna, and so before I go to Nagarjuna's response, the idea of the scale that needs to be calibrated. So a scale that needs to be calibrated, how do you do that? You find a weight that's been weighed by other scales and you put it on the scale that needs to be calibrated. And if it agrees with the other scales, then you know that it is reading the true weight of that stone or whatever it is, the standard weight is. So if it coheres with all of the other scales, then you trust it. That's how you act pragmatically in life. Well, what if all the scales are wrong? There's no proof that they're not all incorrect. And then as we'll see, Gungesha says, okay, granted, but you're splitting hairs, do you really act 
as if all scales in the world might be wrong? Or do you just accept that, oh, these scales all agree, therefore it's calibrated? There's no reason to go to those kinds of extremes of skeptical doubt. And you don't, and it's obvious you don't really believe them because you act as if you do believe certain things. But we'll get to that. So here's Nagarjuna's response to the realist's claim that a source of knowledge is like a self-illuminating lamp. It illuminates itself and all the other objects of knowledge. Here's what Nagarjuna says. He says on page 315, the analogies are inept, are inapt. First of all, a lamp does not illuminate itself, for it does not stand in need of illumination. Second, something to be proved cannot be a prover. A father cannot be the son of his own son. So that's the circular reasoning idea. Um, so he's saying that a lamp does not illuminate itself, for it does not stand in need of illumination. I'm not exactly sure what that means. It doesn't illuminate itself because it's already lit up, and therefore it doesn't, you know, this is a translation from ancient texts, so if a lamp does not illuminate itself, I can understand that. You could say, yeah, someone came with a candle and lit that lamp. Well, who lit that person's candle, that other person? You end up in an infinite regress. Um, and then, so I'll leave it at that, but I will say a self-illuminating lamp in modern cosmology would be the singularity of the Big Bang. In the singularity, you have an infinite regress of gravity. Space-time regresses into itself infinitely. And if you say, well, what's the source of everything? From a modern cosmological perspective, you could say the singularity. Well, what's the source of the singularity? Nothing. It regresses into itself infinitely. So you kind of counteract the argument of infinite regress with an infinite regress. And it is a self-illuminating lamp if if you believe in the Big Bang, it's just all of light emerges out of nothing, a point of infinite density, which is an infinite regress of gravity. So would the singularity stand as a foundation of absolute truth? At any rate, I think it's just interesting. The idea of infinite regress, it just reminds me of the gravitational singularity. Okay, so now moving on to Gungesha. Um, I'll just read um, on the page 319, the very last paragraph. I'm going to read his words. This is the translation. So, thus we may reject the argument that contradiction, and that's pragmatic contradictions. Pragmatic contradiction, the example was, you know, why do you create a smoky fire to get rid of mosquitoes if you don't really believe that you can know for a fact that when you start a fire, there's smoke? You do believe in knowledge. Your very actions, your pragmatic approach to life is the proof that you believe that knowledge is possible. So, you know, it's just, it's just words for you that you don't really believe when you say there's no such thing as knowledge. So, thus we may reject the argument that contradiction, meaning pragmatic contradiction, cannot block a vicious infinite regress. It's the doubter's own behavior that proves the lie to the doubt, that blocks it. How do you stop the infinite regress of knowledge, of identifying knowledge sources? You say, well, we know this is true because people act as if it's true. And then, if people say, well, that's not a good enough like the reason i mean yeah everyone acts that way but that doesn't prove that it's true it could still be wrong and then gengesh simply says if it really could be wrong how come nobody acts as if it is so there's this basic response to the extreme skepticism of nagarjuna and that is the question number two for part b how does gengesh reject the issue of circular reasoning an infinite regress. So, and for the circular reasoning part, it's like the scale, you know, why, why do you doubt the coherence of the world in general? Things work this way. Fire creates smoke. Drinking water quenches thirst. There's all kinds of things that we act according to uh, the belief that they're true and trustworthy sources of knowledge. So, um, if one thing is supported by something else in, in the world and there's a certain coherence, that should be enough to just take it at face value. 
things are as they seem unless you can prove that they're not. That's, that's why, I, um, so innocent until proven guilty is what I put in my, in my notes here. I'll, I'll read on page 318 in the middle. This is the introductory remarks. Gangesha dismisses this concern that, you know, maybe everything is, a, is an illusion or a dream or something. There's no reason to engage in skeptical doubt of this kind. We have no reason to think that our faculties systematically mislead us. You know, why do you doubt what your common sense tells you? That's their response. And it doesn't seem so philosophically sophisticated, and yet at the same time, it does have a certain pragmatic ring of truth to it. And in the next video, I'm going to skip the order a little bit and go to the question about Leibniz, because that will also prepare you for the discussion two question.